it's just a delight to see a full room, a full house this afternoon for our very special lecture about faith and science. This lecture is part of a series that is in honor of the 50th anniversary of the CSCA, the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation. So this is an organization I'm proud to be a part of um, as its president, how did that happen? Um, and our guest speaker today is its executive director. And we are really celebrating um, the intersection of faith and science and, and, and we do that in many ways. I'm going to show you a little more about the CSCA, but I wanna start this afternoon with thank yous. First of all, thank you to God, our creator of heaven and earth, and all the good gifts he has given us that we can be here. Secondly, I want to acknowledge with thanks that we are here in the King's University in Edmonton on Treaty 6 territory, and we have deep gratitude to all the First Nations peoples who have lived for thousands of years and stewarded this land and this territory as well. I also want to give a thank you to Cassidy, Dr. Van der Schee, there she is, because this time slot and this lecture space is her usual intro chem space. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you especially for all the students who, who came to join us today and other guests as well. Um, this is a real treat. And I don't wanna delay too much more before we get to hear Arnold, but I want to share with you that our summer conference with our uh, ASA, American Scientific Affiliation organization that we are, we are the Canadian expression of, our summer conference this summer, July, end of July, is in University of Toronto, Mississauga. And we have a video. Hi, my name is Arnold Sikama. I'm the executive director of the CSCA, the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation. We are the expression of the ASA in Canada. Next year, we're celebrating CSCA's 50th anniversary, having been formed one year after the ASA's meeting held at York University. Our anniversary celebration committee is co-chaired by Rebecca Schneider and Judy Toronchuk. We're holding a Canada-wide lecture series with past presidents throughout the year. We'll be presenting a series of questions and answers with 50 featured CSCA members and holding other fun year-long activities, as well as special events at the July meeting. Speaking of the July meeting, we'll be hosting that at the University of Toronto Mississauga in 2023. Our local arrangements chair is Vlad Passerin, and he'll be assisted by Bob Geddes. UTM is a short distance from Canada's largest airport, Toronto Pearson, and is not much further from the downtown Toronto airport. Plus, it's only an eight-hour drive from both Chicago and Boston. UTM occupies a beautiful campus right next to the historical and naturally significant Credit River. We're working on a few field trip possibilities, including geological features of moraines and the Niagara Escarpment. Toronto's Royal Ontario Museum will be able to have a guided tour of the new Dawn of Life exhibit, which includes the world's largest collection of Burgess Shale fossils. In the Guelph region, we'll be able to see the Arosha Cedar Haven Eco Center with its focus on sustainable development and conservation education, as well as Creef Hills, which is the national retreat and conference center of the Presbyterian Church in Canada. And we'll be able to see the Royal Botanical Gardens. And now let's hear about the conference program itself. Greetings, I'm Janet Warren and along with Robert Mann, I'm delighted to be program co-chair for next year's upcoming annual meeting where we are delighted to be celebrating CSCA's 50th anniversary. We have an exciting lineup of plenary speakers across the entire range of the physical sciences to speak about our theme of the future of science and faith. We have 2018 Nobel laureate Donna Strickland, who will speak to this from the perspective of the physical sciences. Author and filmmaker Megan DeFranza will give us a perspective from the psychological and behavioral sciences. We have Emeritus Director of the Faraday Institute, Dennis Alexander, who will talk about the future of science and faith from the perspective of the life and health sciences. We also have IBM Master Inventor, 
Joanna Eng, CEO of Deverham Design, who will talk to us about the future of science and faith from the perspective of the information sciences. And last, but certainly not least, we have theologian Victoria Lorimar from the University of Queensland, who will talk about theological perspectives on the future of the science-faith dialogue. We look forward to seeing you next summer at the 50th anniversary of the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation, a joint meeting with the American Scientific Affiliation. thing I'd like to say, I put our website up here, student membership in the organization and registration for the summer conference is free. Think about that people and I hope you can make it. So now I'd like to shift our attention. I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Arnold Sigma. As I've mentioned, He's the executive director of RCSCA. He's also a professor of physics at Trinity Western University in Langley, British Columbia. What else can we say about him? Chair, Mathematical Sciences Department, a theoretical physicist, a background in general relativity and condensed matter theory. His current research interests are in theoretical biophysics and in the Christian philosophy of science, particularly in the relationship between physics and biology. Since 97, he's been involved in Christian higher education, joined the Executive Council of CSCA uh, quite some time ago. In 2011, he was a past president, which is why he's speaking here, and has been our Executive Director since 2018. And uh, he and his wife, Valerie, who is a horticulturalist, leading one of our summer tours in horticulture, um, have been in BC since 91, and they have three adult children and some grandchildren, two grandchildren. Um, so very happy that you can join us to talk today, Arnold, and uh, we look forward to what you have to share with us. Well, good afternoon, folks. I'm glad that you're able to be here. Uh, such a great uh, crowd. I didn't know I'd be speaking in an organic chemistry uh, meeting slot, but that, that works. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm speaking of, about... Uh, uh, science um, and the creation, fall, redemption uh, narrative. So I'll begin by saying a few words about my own background in terms of, of Edmonton and the CSCA, uh, and then uh, I will explain what we mean, what I mean by the creation, fall, redemption narrative, and then and then um, the last three parts of the talk are about creation and science, fall and science, redemption and science. So Edmonton, my my journey in Edmonton was. Uh, in 1990, I was here for a summer uh, USRA, NSERC USRA project at the University of Alberta. I was working with Dr. Werner Israel, and I, I encountered challenges between my then thinking about young earth creationism and Big Bang cosmology that I was working on. And then I also spent uh, a number of years after Edmonton, partly formed by Edmonton, in, in exploring uh, connections and disconnections between young earth creationism and, and general relativity. So here is Dr. Werner Israel. Who is um, who passed away only last year, and I had the honor of speaking about him at uh, the Canadian Association of Physicists meeting last June in Ontario. He was my advisor for a, an undergraduate research project, and the, a paper came out of that. My first published paper in January 1991 seems like a long time ago. Um, black hole mergers and mass inflation in a bouncing universe. And during that summer, I encountered some significant challenges because. I was, at that time, a fully committed um, young Earth creationist. I believed that the world was about 6,000 years old, as I had been led to uh, believe that the world uh, that, that the Bible taught. And I was now working with a world-renowned expert on cosmology on matters regarding the Big Bang. And so one of the ways that showed up was that we had interesting conversations back and forth. And if some of you haven't done research projects in theoretical physics before, here's how it works. 
you spend the summer talking with a person for a while. At the Blackboard, you're doing calculations on your own. You're emailing things back and forth. Yes, even email back in 1990. Um, and and uh, about a month before the summer was over, I got an email from Werner Israel with a paper. Here, he said, here's the paper that we wrote this summer, uh, which was really his first draft based on all of the conversations we've had over that summer. And um, his my name was first, and then his name was second. So then I sent it back to him. I said, no, no, you're the primary author. You should be first. I should be second. And also a few other changes here and there. And along the way, I wanted to uh, uh, highlight uh, one of the important changes in my faith and science journey. And that is that in one draft of the paper uh, that he had sent me, it said, the accepted age of the universe is 10 to the 60 Planck units. Uh, uh, so, he, sorry, he said the age of the universe is 10 to the 60 Planck units. And I needed him to insert the word accepted because I did not believe the world was that old. That corresponds to around uh, 15 billion uh, years, 10 to the 60 Planck units. And so I wanted to insert the word accepted because I, it was true that this was what the accepted scientific thinking was, that the world was that old. I myself didn't want to take that on as a statement for myself, but saying that's how I believe the world was in terms of age. And so he actually accepted my insertion of the word accepted because he was a generous and humble uh, gentleman. Um, and that allowed me to have confidence in what I was also speaking about in this paper. So uh, he also referred me to uh, Dr. Don Page, who is still a professor in uh, the physics department at the University of Alberta. And uh, he uh, is, is a Baptist and a, and a committed uh, Christian. And so Werner Israel knew that I was struggling with my Christian thinking about science. And so he said, why don't you talk to another Christian who's actually working in this field? And it turns out he was actually away, Don Page was away most of the summer. And then when he did come back, I was actually too afraid to talk to him. And I also was a little undergraduate. And I was, uh, I had a very small ecumenical vision at the time. I figured if he's a Baptist, he's probably not really a Christian because I'm not a Baptist. Uh, and Baptist, <laughs> you know, so I've changed my thinking. I know probably some of you are Baptists, and I fully accept that you are Christian. So I have no trouble with that, and I work at a Christian university with people from many different denominational backgrounds. So um, that was part of my Edmonton uh, journey, and that followed up, uh, followed into uh, a presentation I gave the following uh, summer, uh, where I actually uh, created this graphic down here on the bottom right, uh, where I explained that we really can't know much about much of the universe's history, because all we have is a bit of geology and a bit of astronomy, that connects things from the from the distant uh, um, past, perhaps. But who knows? It could have started anywhere. And so my thinking was, here's how we can solve the problem. Um, 6,000 years ago, the world started with its current uh, setup all in place, looking like it was really old, and, and that solves the matter. Um, so another thing that happened in Edmonton uh, was that a year or two after I started my graduate studies, so actually I switched my field. I switched out of working in general relativity to working in condensed matter theory, partly because of like, the fact that I couldn't handle the science and faith challenges. I had not yet been introduced to the CSEA. Um, and so uh, the hope of these kinds of presentations is that some of you who may be having challenges in science and faith would connect with the CSEA as an organization where there are lots of Christians in the sciences who can mentor and uh, encourage you in your Christian faith and in your scientific uh, career. So in, in around 1992 or 94, I'm not sure what year it was, I think it might have been 92, there was a uh, creationism conference in Alberta. And I was a committed creationist. I was a graduate student now in the University of British Columbia. But I flew to Edmonton for this conference. And I met a number of people who were working on solving the problems that I thought would help me as well. And so um, some of the papers and conversations that resulted from that included um, this book, Starlight and Time, by uh, Russ Humphreys. Uh, and uh, I thought, this is a great book. I'm going to learn in this book how I can be... Um, a committed Christian who believes that the world is about 6,000 years old, and it will solve the problem of how it can be that stars are so far away, take their light so many years to, to get to us, uh, millions and billions of years. And so I read the book, and I was very excited at first, but then I realized after a while that actually this person was a nuclear engineer, not a general relativity a theoretical physicist, and so it turned out that I knew more general relativity than he did, and a lot of it was actually mistaken. And so it turned out that that book uh, was a dead end for me. Um, I also um, connected somehow, perhaps through that conference, with a fellow named Robert Gentry, who died only three years ago now. Um, and he worked. He was uh, also a geo he was a geologist, but he was beginning to work on how we could use the methods of general relativity to also solve 
the problems of the age of the universe. And he had some alternative models that he was working on. By that time, I was starting to have uh, some troubles with the way general relativity was being used uh, by people in that in that young Earth creationist community. And I challenged uh, Bob Gentry quite a lot. And um, I identified his math and physics errors along the way, and he never got his papers published in the scientific journals. Um, but I had a, a, about a, a decade or a decade and a half long conversation with him, including some meetings and, and email over the years. And so that all uh, is a bit of my Edmonton background. And then my CSCA background uh, developed near the end of my graduate studies. I had a friend, uh, um, Rick Bartman, who was a physicist at Triumph, a, new, a particle accelerator, uh, a nuclear laboratory at the University of British Columbia, and he introduced me to the to the CSEA in 1996. And so I became a member, a student member. I think student membership was free even then. And um, and so I joined. Uh, and then my journey with the CSEA has continued. So I spoke at a conference in Arkansas in 1999. And then I was appointed to be the program co-chair for the 20, 2008 uh, meeting in Oregon. And a few years later, I became the president, the vice president, uh, and then the president and the past president, and then the executive director. Um, and during the local chapters project, um, which was funded by Templeton for the period of 2016 to 2018, I also gave a national lecture tour on quantum physics and Christianity. And down here on the bottom right, you see a picture of some people in this room uh, uh, having dinner together on the day that I gave that uh, talk. I gave a talk here in this uh, campus as well as at the University of Alberta that day. Um, so that's been a, been a bit of my journey with the CSEA. So that's a, by way of sort of introduction and connecting with the, the organization. So what is the creation, fall, redemption narrative, and how does that connect to, to science? That's the bulk of my talk then. So I have a number of uh, authors, that some, of our, some of whom are maybe more or less familiar, depending on your background, that introduce what is meant by the creation, fall, redemption narrative. So the idea is that scripture tells a story. It tells a story of how God created the world, and then that the world is now a broken, fallen world, and that there will be hope for redemption of the world in the future. And so that is what I'm going to be addressing in terms of how does science fit into that overall picture. So just uh, uh, before we even get into how science connects, what is that creation, fall, redemption narrative? And so here are some quotes, and you can read some of them now or perhaps on the recording in detail. I won't read all of them out loud to you, but Herman Bavink says uh, the following things, and you can't get it in his original words because that's Dutch. Um, but a translation by Williams on the top here, and then a formulation, a reformulation of it by Al Walters on the bottom. So I'll read what Al Walters uh, says uh, that the creation, fall, redemption narrative is, as described by Herman Bavink. God the Father has reconciled his created but fallen world through the death of his Son and renews it into a kingdom of God by his Spirit. And so you can see it's Trinitarian and it's cosmic. It's not just talking about people being saved. The Bible is not just about God saving people, uh, but God creating a world. That world is fallen, and the world will be redeemed. Uh, and so the creation, fall, redemption narrative is a way of answering a number of basic questions that everybody has. A lot of people are asking, where do we come from? Um, what's wrong with the world, and why, and, and what can we hope for in the world um, in the future, in our near-term future, perhaps the long-term future? So the, the creation, fall, redemption uh, is narrative is cosmic in scope. And part of that is based on Scripture itself. So in Scripture, we have the idea in Psalm 145 that God loves everything he has made. God's love does not extend only to people, or perhaps even more narrowly, some people might think only to like his chosen people, but God's love is cosmic. God loves the entire cosmos. In fact, this is also in John 3.16. So, as you all know, you have memorized John 3, 16, for God so loved the cosmos. Actually, most of us memorize it as God so loved the world, but the Greek word is cosmos. God loves the entire cosmos. Why did God send his son? Because God loves the cosmos. And so that is an, a, a hint that scripture gives us that God uh, has a plan, not only for humans and his relationship with humans, but with all of the cosmos. And that's where part of the connection right away begins with how does science then factor into that story. Um, Al Walters, who I already mentioned, has a book called Creation Regained. Uh, and uh, the idea here, I'll just read Al Walters for you. God does not make junk, and we dishonor the Creator if we take a negative view of the work of his hands when he, when he himself takes such a positive view. In fact, so positive a view did God take of what he had created that he refused to scrap it when mankind spoiled it, but determined instead, at the cost of his son's life, 
to make it new and good again. God does not make junk, and he does not junk what he has made. So creation, fall, redemption are all in this uh, passage from, from Al Walters as well. Um, another uh, pair of authors, Craig Bartholomew and uh, Mike Goheen, and the title of this lecture refers to that, that drama, that narrative as well, the drama of scripture. When God set out to redeem his creation from sin and sin's effects on it, his ultimate purpose was that what he had once created good should be utterly restored, that the whole cosmos should once again live and thrive under his beneficent rule. And this is a long quote from Tom Wright, but I just wanted to illustrate that uh, one of the world's most prominent theologians also has the same uh, kind of perspective. That is, Christians tell a story of a good creator longing to put the world back into the good order for which it, for which it was designed. Some of you are speed readers, and so you can read the whole uh, quote. Um, so, uh, and then the shortest version of this is Alison McGrath, who is himself, uh, who is a scientist and a theologian in the UK. And I had the pleasure of spending a, a few years of summers working with him uh, as well. Though the world has fallen through sin, it remains God's good creation and is capable of being redeemed. So how does that fit then into, how does science fit into that creation fall uh, redemption narrative? How do Christians who are scientists see their work perhaps as, as, as part of that overall drama of scripture, the drama of, of the cosmos? So um, a few points that I'm going to be speaking about. The world is amenable to science. Um, God has a covenant with creation. Uh, God endorses our senses uh, the idea of critical realism connects to uh, what it means that God has created the world. And then, uh, fifthly, lastly, it's not just about creation being somewhere where God's, where things start. So I have a number of authors and that have influenced how I've thought about these things over time. And the earliest uh, author here is, is Nancy Piercy, whose book, The Soul of Science, points out a number of features that the world has that makes the world be just the right kind of thing that we can study science um, that we can study the world, and that we can develop uh, scientific practices. So these are uh, specifically Christian ways of thinking of the world, thinking of the cosmos, and so we refer to the world as creation. Alison McGrath makes that point, that the, the basic Christian way of understanding the world is that the world is God's creation. Um, and creation has properties that make it amenable to doing science. So creation is real. It's not imaginary. It's not um, virtual. Uh, it's, it's real. We're, we actually do interact with uh, a real creation. And we'll see a bit more about this in terms of critical realism. Creation is subject to laws. The idea that there is a lawmaker who has established an orders, orders and principles for the world to function according to is um, what makes science possible. Creation is good. It's not something that we hope to one day be rid of. We, we want to get um, out of this world into some new... Uh, spiritual only reality of the future, but God is a good creator and he made the world as a good creation and therefore it's worthy worthy of study. God is is ra has rationality about himself and so he created the world in a rational uh, sort of way. And uh, finally the point is that the world is not a divine thing. We're free to actually manipulate the world. We're, we're free to like poke around and do things and not be afraid that the world is somehow a god that we might be disturbing if we are doing experiments. And so these are the features of the world that Nancy Piercy identifies as being important for the development of science. And, and she identifies these as, as coming largely from a Christian way of thinking, not um, from other uh, religious uh, uh, backgrounds. So one of my main perspectives about how creation functions um, with respect to science is through the notion of covenant. Now, some of you, depending on your background, and in my background was like this, that I figured God's covenant is a covenant made with people. God makes a covenant with uh, with individual people, or maybe with communities of people. But in fact, the Bible speaks much more broadly about covenant, and that is God has a covenant with creation. So uh, in Genesis 8, 22, uh, the rainbow becomes a sign of the covenant, uh, and the covenant is as follows. As long as the earth endures, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. So God is making a promise to be faithful to uh, the way that he will relate to the world. And that faithfulness we depend upon in order to be able to do our scientific work. Uh, we expect that the world will function regularly. And what basis do we have for that regular functioning of the world, except that God has a covenant with creation and that God is faithful to that covenant with creation. Jeremiah 33, 22, 
uh, speaks about this even more clearly. God has made a covenant with the day and the night, and God established the laws of heaven and earth. That connects with the idea that God is the lawmaker, uh, and it connects the idea of covenant uh, with things in the created world uh, connected to law- laws in, in, in science that we often function according to. Especially in physics, I guess we have laws of physics. Uh, in other fields of sciences, it's maybe a bit less uh, thinking about laws, but other, other ways of relating to the world. So in a few weeks, we have uh, Good Friday and Easter. And, and here's a painting by Caravaggio, uh, The Incredulity of St. Thomas. Um, Jesus is encouraging St. Thomas to trust his senses. And that's one of the things that we do in science. We have to trust that what we are touching and, and hearing and, um, and tasting and smelling are things that really exist and that our senses are giving us some actual information about the world. And Jesus encouraged me here. Thomas is, you can check to see if I really am the one who died on the cross and is now alive again. And so you could, I encourage you to read that story uh, and maybe think about this, uh, this painting. Uh, in, in, the, in the coming weeks as we get closer to Easter. And this is actually talked about in, even in a bit more detail by the Apostle John in his first epistle, where I've highlighted here the, the words relating to senses in, in yellow. Uh, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, etc. And this is speaking about the disciples and the Apostles' experience of Jesus. They're saying that we actually touched this person. He's not just a figment of our imagination. He wasn't like a, a spiritual uh, cloud that we would sort of approach and then like, oh, he's poofed, gone. No, this was a real person who really spoke. And um, this is the word of life, Jesus Christ, the word of life. Um, and the senses that we have give us the confidence that he really existed, that we really interacted with him, and that you, the people that we're speaking to uh, and sharing this good news with, can also have that confidence in relaying our sense experience on uh, to you. And so I would regard this passage and the pre- previous one as well, as, as God is saying to us, you can trust your senses. Not meaning that every single time we can trust our senses. There are optical illusions and, and things like that. But uh, one of the things we do in science is we extend our senses. Like we use a telescope to see further. We use uh, microphones to hear things that we couldn't otherwise hear. We use... Um, uh, laser interfering, interferometric gravity observations to check the, the, the lengthening and, and shortening of space time to check for what's, what are the effects of big, of, of black holes crashing into each other in a distant uh, universe. So in the sciences, we are sort of given an endorsement by God to do our work and to say, this is my created reality. You can trust that your senses are telling you something about that created reality. And a big way of thinking of that is what's called critical realism. And I've highlighted John Polkinghorn as as a significant figure in advancing the idea of critical realism as being a Christian philosophical position. The position basically goes like this, and maybe some of you have taken philosophy courses. Epistemology models ontology. That what that what we can know is a reliable guide to what is the case. That is, the things that we're studying really exist. And the ways that we're studying them depend upon the way they are, but then we are able to learn something true about them as we proceed. Uh, Thomas Torrance says that we investigate things in a way that is consistent with its nature. So we don't investigate everything the same way. Like in biology, you might do dissections. Well, in, in physics, we don't do dissections. Uh, we use uh, neutron scattering. You know, um, and in sociology, we might do, you know, interviews. Uh, and in other fields, we do different things. So each field of study has its own uh, methods and approaches because those fields are studying different things and different aspects of the world. And um, some of you have heard of the philosopher Herman Doiwerd, who also speaks a lot about the multitude of different aspects that the world shows itself uh, to us in, including uh, objects having physical and biological and economic uh, features. For example, a, a table is a physical thing. It can support st- things sitting upon it. Uh, a table can be made of wood and therefore has biological uh, characteristics. Uh, and um, a table forms uh, has a social role and there's economic aspects, etc. So one of the ways that critical realism functions in a Christian philosophy of understanding the world is that it, uh, it helps us see that the world can't be reduced to just one discipline. There are multiples 
of many, many disciplines, and those disciplines interact with each other. There's one reason why in my research I try to connect uh, how it is that physics and biology relate. They're not the same thing. They study different things, but yet somehow they are related. Um, I want to just mention briefly that when we talk about the doctrine of creation, we're not talking about the beginning of the world. We're talking about, in fact, the existence of the world. So the world exists and we study that. Not all of science studies the beginning of the world. In fact, none of science studies the actual beginning of the world. Science can only study the history of the world back to a certain point. Um, and sometimes you uh, get the idea that um, what if the world might have existed forever? Then we can get rid of the idea of a creator. Some people would say these kinds of things. Well, it turns out that Thomas Aquinas already um, put that idea to rest by saying, even if the world had existed forever, it has no less need of a creator. There's still a creator needed to create a creation. Um, creation accounts for the existence of things, uh, not for the changes in things, not for the coming to uh, being necessarily. So not only the coming to being, but just their their bare existence. So even an infinite universe, which had all existed, could still be a sign that God created uh, the world. And we can still function as Christians in the sciences by studying that creation. Okay, so that was it's called creation, fall, redemption. And so those are some features of creation that uh, I think connect to our work in the sciences as Christians. How about fall uh, and science? And so how does our work as scientists who are Christians connect to, in some way, the fall? Um, now, I won't be talking in detail about um, about what, what the fall even means, but just focusing on the effects of the fall. Um, and in Genesis, there's, a, there's reference to the curse. So what is... The curse uh, on creation. Is it natural evil? Is it the fact that we don't know everything? Is it entropy? Um, I'm going to speak a bit about creation, about the brokenness of the world, and then also about how sin actually is evident in, in science. So in Genesis 3, um, God says uh, to Adam and Eve, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Now, when we think about that as scientists, there's some interesting things to, uh, to ask. It, does this mean that natural evil arose when God pronounced this curse upon the first sin? And when we look at this, we realize that we have a history in this world of volcanoes that predate humans. We have a history of meteor impacts that predate humans. We have a history of storms and diseases that predate humans. All of these kinds of things that some people call natural evil or bad things in the world, um, have existed long before humans did. And interestingly, some of us are, who are marine biologists might be a bit disturbed by a promise given in Revelation that one day there will be no more sea. And so how do we deal with that? Uh, so certainly there's, there's interesting uh, metaphor and things to think about in this regard. I think the sea does not necessarily mean that place featuring beautiful, bountiful marine life, but it's a place of horror and threat. And so there will be no more horrors and threats. It doesn't mean there will no, no longer be an ocean, but the ocean will no longer pose a horror or threat to us. So looking back to uh, volcanoes, here's um, a picture showing the, the Pacific plate. Some of you have perhaps been to Hawaii. And if volcanoes came about only in response to human sin, that God made volcanoes start to happen because Adam and Eve sinned, then we wouldn't have Hawaii because Hawaii uh, was already going on long before um, before humans came on the scene. So the Pacific Plate moves across a hot spot and there's volcanoes. And what do volcanoes result in? Well, death and destruction, maybe sometimes, but also into beauty and amazing uh, ecological uh, flora and fauna of Hawaii. And so... Volcanoes, apparently, have been used by God to create um, diversity and wonder um, in this world that we can already uh, begin to explore. So what I'm saying is I don't think that, uh, that the fall means that these things started to happen. We also know that, uh, that we have a history of meteor impacts. If we hadn't had the meteor impact that killed off the, the, uh, the dinosaurs, we may not have arisen as humans on this world. We needed to have space. So one of the ways that God is, seems to have prepared 
this world for human existence is that he wiped out the dinosaurs by causing a meteor to crash into it. So that meteor did not crash into the earth because of human sin, because it happened long before. Uh, but yet there's this kind of an event that sometimes is described as natural evil. So I guess we're, I'm giving negatives on things that, that I don't think are a result of the fall or an example really even of the brokenness of the world. Uh, here's another Alberta story for you. So um, in Dinosaur Provincial Park in 1989, there was a discovery of, of, um, of a horned dinosaur, Centrosaurus apertus. And this dinosaur roamed the Earth about 76 million years ago. And it was discovered in 1989 down in southern Alberta. And then uh, some scientists from the Royal Ontario Museum were there and noticed it in 2017. And they did some further study. And then a couple years ago, uh, they published a paper showing that there was osteocarsoma, bone cancer, on this dinosaur. So this dinosaur, living 76 million years ago, had cancer. And so is cancer a result of human sin? Well, this seems to indicate that's not the case. So cancer existed long before uh, human sin. So um, how do we deal uh, with these kinds of things? Uh, is the fall, uh, perhaps, uh, does the fall result in incomplete knowledge? Uh, I've come across people who say that because of the fall into sin, we now no longer know everything. We once did know everything, then we sinned, and then we lost that knowledge. Uh, I think that's a, a bit of a stretch. Uh, and it also uh, dispenses with the dif difference between the fact that we're finite beings and that we're fallen beings. So finiteness is not fallenness. The fact that we are limited um, in, our, in, our, in our time frame, in our spatial location, in our uh, awareness of the things in the world, in our ability to uh, study the world, in our knowledge of facts about the world, that's, those are all just because we're finite beings. Uh, none of us knows all of the digits of pi. It would, in fact, require an infinite being to know all of the digits of pi. There's an infinite number of digits. So no finite being could rattle off all those digits, all infinite number of digits of pi. And I think Jesus, as a human being, in his humanity, also did not know all of the digits of pi. But Jesus is described as someone who never sinned in the Bible. And so is sin the result of... Does sin result in our finite knowledge? Uh, I would say no, it doesn't make much sense. It also doesn't uh, connect with the idea of the cultural mandate, where, we, where before the fall into sin, as described in Genesis, humans were given a calling to explore the world and to discover the world and to, uh, to develop the world. Um, and that was not something that started when the fall began. People were already learning and discovering new things. If sin meant that you have finite knowledge, then why would you be discovering things be without sin? If you hadn't yet sinned, there's no point in discovery because you already know everything according to this way of thinking. And so that tells me that the fall does not result in incomplete knowledge. I also come across people who say that the fall results in entropy. Some of you have maybe heard of the idea of entropy. Entropy is often described as chaos uh, coming from order. So when something starts off nice and tidy and sorted out, and then it gets messy over time. We call that an increase in entropy. And there's a second law of thermodynamics, that, which says that any closed system always increases in entropy as time goes on. If it's an open system, it can decrease if energy inputs or exports are occurring. Uh, but as long as the system is closed, the entropy is going to have to increase, or at least definitely not decrease. And so there is a sense that disorder grows as a result of entropy. And so people have suggested uh, that the fall into sin resulted in this entropy to begin. Now, it turns out that that's not, that can't really be the case either. And so um, the sun warms the earth. That could not happen without, a lot, without an increase in entropy. So anytime there's a heat transfer between one object and another object, uh, the hotter object, as it gets colder, uh, loses entropy. It actually gets more ordered. And the colder object gets hotter, and it actually grows in entropy. And it turns out that the colder object grows in more entropy than the hotter object uh, goes down in. So that overall goes up. And so entropy increase always results from heat transfer. So if you have a hot cup of coffee, it does not get hotter by sitting there. It gets colder by sitting there. That is the result of entropy increase. That's described as an entropy increase. That cup of coffee, if somehow sin resulted in 
entropy increased, that would also mean that things could not undergo heat transfer prior to sin, which would mean the sun could not be heating the earth, uh, for example, and ice cubes wouldn't melt, and uh, nothing would change. The world would be have to be entirely static in order for this to be the case, and the world never was a totally static world. Um, one of the really important, valuable ways that I think does help us understand about what the effect of the fall really is, is to think about the world and our place in the world in a network of relationships. Each one of us, um, thinking of you there as yourself, has relationships with, with God, with other people, and with the world. So this is Colin Gunton, um, who says, we all have relations with the world, with other human persons, and with God. And these are not meant to be reciprocal relationships, but they are relationships. Every one of us has those relationships. Um, Nicholas Wolderstorff uh, adds another one, and that is how the self relates to self. So reflecting your, on yourself is another relationship. So Nicholas Wolderstorff um, describes human flourishing uh, as, as proper functioning of all of the relationships that we have. So if every one of those four types of relationships that we have is functioning very well and perfectly and in accordance with God's good order, that that is called shalom, and that is good human flourishing. Another uh, pair of authors, um, Brian Fickard and Kelly Hepick, have uh, drawn it out like this, uh, where they have a, a wheel with four spokes. And so you are at the sort of center of this wheel as a person who has a mind, affections, will, and body. And you have those four relationships, relationship with God, relationship with self, relationship with creation, or relationship with others. So what happens when we have sin and the fall? One of the things that happens there is that we break that vertical relationship. Uh, when our relationship with God is broken, uh, then that affects one of those four spokes. But if you've ever ridden on a bicycle which has four spokes, probably more, more spokes than four, uh, when one spoke goes, then other ones also start to go. Right? So over time, those three other relationship types of relationships also end up uh, getting uh, distorted, damaged, influenced, and affected, and so forth. And so um, the idea that the thorns and the thistles will cause trouble for us is not God is going to say, I'm now going to bring thorns and thistles into the world, which never existed before, but I'm going to, it's going to be that you are now going to be having a troubled relationship with thorns and thistles. You're going to be having problems with cancer. You're going to be having problems with other people. There's going to be challenges that are resulting from the brokenness of all of these kinds of relationships. So one of the things I think we can do in science is to try to see, is there any way that using our scientific abilities, we can identify where is the brokenness between um, various parts of this diagram. And I think in science, the most obvious one that we can be able to focus on is our relationship with the environment or the creation. So identify where is our brokenness between humans and the created world? Where have we messed up the world? Um, pollution, uh, climate change, uh, all of these uh, kinds of things. These are evidences of a broken relationship with the world. A perfect world, a really well-functioning world, would not have uh, these kinds of broken relationships. And so in science, we can at least begin to observe and notice what are these types of relationships that are perhaps broken, and how can we perhaps use science to bring about their redemption. So a few other ways that sin appears in science is just in the fact that we are humans doing scientific work. So when we are doing scientific work, we're doing things like selecting and we're maybe sometimes suppressing things. And so if we do an experiment and we want to be proud of our results, we might pretend that we didn't get this bad result over here, right? We might fudge the data. That would be an example of being a sinful human being in the act, action of, in the scientific activity itself. We also have, in the scientific community, there's been uh, lots of attacking other people. Like, uh, I'm smarter than you, you're kind of dumb, your idea is stupid usually said in fancier words, um, uh, and sometimes even in peer review and in published uh, articles and that sort of thing, where we attack other people. We're often proud, especially, I think, in physics. As a, as a graduate student in physics, I was very proud of my knowledge in physics, my ability to do physics problems, uh, and the fact that physics was going to solve all of the world's problems. If anybody wanted to be really, like, why are chemists, like, they're not really very smart because if they were smart, they'd be physicists, right? <laughs> and so that was my pride and arrogance, which I would regard as a sin. Uh, and a reductionism, I think, another example of sin, where you think it's connected with what I had there about the pride. That is, 
thinking that my own discipline is the only important one. Everything else is subservient to it. And my discipline should really expand and take over all the other ones. And there are definitely even Nobel Prize winning physicists, not the speaker, Donna Strickland, who's speaking at our conference this summer, but others like Steven Weinberg, who actually have explicitly stated that physics can actually help us, can give us the understanding of every single thing about the whole world, including like human emotion. Like physics can really be the thing that will help us know all about human emotion. And I say no to that. That's a sinful reductionistic idea. We have fields of psychology that actually address those things much better than physics ever would. And psychology can't be reduced uh, to physics. And then finally, um, I think it's a sin in science and a, of a type of idolatry to say the world uh, can, we will use science as our savior. So if only we would just be really good scientists, then we, uh, then humanity will be saved. And all problems of humanity will be addressed through scientific work. And that is sort of a savior complex that some scientists might have, and that some people might look to science as being that savior. And I would think, think that uh, we really need the savior, and science is not, is not the savior. So that's creation and fall. And our last part is here about redemption. So how does the redemptive aspect of, of the creation, fall, redemption narrative of scripture affect or relate to how we can function in science. And I have sort of four uh, main uh, points to make over here. Expansion of knowledge, dissemination of wonder, unification of knowledge, and science for the glory and of God and benefit of humankind. And one of the ways that I think science is redemptive is that it gives us, uh, all of humanity, perhaps the individual scientists, but also as that knowledge is disseminated, uh, an expansion of knowledge. I think it's just a wonder, don't we all experience wonder and joy and begin to function perhaps more um, uh, uh, fully humanly when we see and learn more things about the world. I think knowledge, we all crave knowledge, and science helps us achieve this kind of knowledge. And so looking at interesting things like, you know, we have a telescope that uh, we now can see really, really detailed things on happening in other very, very remote parts of the world. So the James Webb Space Telescope, and here's this picture that was unveiled last July of the details of the of the cosmic cliffs on on the Carina Nebula, uh, where we can see stars being born, and we can see you know the clouds of dust gathering, and uh, all of the wonders of of very far distant creation. And I think everyone looks at that, and their hearts are lifted up. Hopefully not like you're hopefully not horrified and shocked and want to shrivel away, but you'll like thrive and be joyful by seeing these sort of things. Uh, I don't know if this one was a lot of joy to. The, uh, to Robert Hooke when he saw the flea through his microscope. Um, but in a sense, we all can uh, experience wonder and joy at all of the small and big things of the world. Uh, I've been, uh, through my wife, partly, largely, uh, learning a lot about mycorrhizae, uh, where you know there's this huge, amazing fungal network of roots that uh, speak to the ecology of forests. Like, isn't that wonderful? And doesn't that bring you joy to learn and discover these kinds of things? And then when we uh, discovered the atom and the nucleus and the electrons, and now the whole standard model where we have all the different parts of the world, um, that, that at least for most people, we're curious. And we, our, our curiosity is satisfied, and then our curiosity is then stretched, and we reach into further uh, knowledge. And that, that is, I think, a redemptive act that science can function in. Um, the Cavendish Laboratory is an interesting place. So in 1874... Uh, in Cambridge, at the University of Cambridge, they have a, a physics a building and a physics laboratory. And it turns out that James Clark Maxwell, who was one of the top physicists of the entire history of science, uh, certainly the top physicist of the 19th century, um, he suggested, can we please put Psalm 111 verse 2 emblazoned above the doors of the Cavendish Laboratory? And so there it is in Latin. Not all of us are Latin experts. I can see some of those words, that they, what they would mean. Um, but it turns out, uh, 100 years later, uh, they need, needed a new building. So they built a new building, and Andrew Briggs, who is a member of the of Christians in Science, which is our UK affiliate organization, he proposed, and he said, you know, James Clark Maxwell got Psalm 111 in Latin above the doors of the Cavendish Laboratory. Can we please put it in English now? And yes, the answer was yes. So the University of Cambridge said, yes, we will put those words in English above the doors of the Cavendish Laboratory. And it's, a, it's an amazing wonder. Uh, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of them, 
sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. It's a bit old English, kind of stilted, but the idea is God does amazing things and we have pleasure in discovering those amazing things. And bringing pleasure to people at satisfying curiosity is a big part of, I think, the redemptive work that science can be involved in. In physics especially, perhaps in other disciplines as well, uh, we have the growth of unification of knowledge. We have the idea that in the, in the 19th century, um, at the beginning of the 19th century, we knew something about electricity, we knew something about magnetism, we knew something about light. By the end of that century, we knew that those were all three the same thing that light is an electromagnetic wave, which is the main topic of my Physics 112 course that I'm teaching this semester. How is it that light is an electromagnetic wave? Maybe some of you have studied that as well. So electricity, magnetism, and optics are unified into one overarching uh, theoretical framework of understanding. And the same thing happens in many aspects of, of physics. And I think that that unification of knowledge is a redemptive feature of science, not one that only Christians can do, obviously, Everyone who does work in science and physics contributed to this um, unification. And it's um, and I think it's a function in part of the fact that there is a Trinitarian creator who's made the world who is three in one. There's something about that that is somehow reflected in the, in the unification of knowledge that we have in the world. And then I think we can also use science even more explicitly for reconciliation. In Colossians 1, um, Paul says... God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ and through him to reconcile himself to himself all things. And again, notice that it doesn't say people. It says all things. So all things in, whether things in heaven or on earth, um, God is, has a plan to reconcile all of them uh, through, um, through Christ. So one of the stories that I like to motivate my students with in terms of their work as scientists and Christians is to think about this passage over here from Matthew. And I first thought of this when, when a student who had come to us from China, probably around 12 years ago, she became a Christian uh, as a st uh, while studying at Trinity Western University. And she went and visited me and said, I came to Trinity because I wanted to become a medical doctor. But now that I'm a Christian, I realize that Christians just pray and for healing. So I don't need to become a medical doctor anymore, right? So what should I go do with my life now? <laughs> And I said to the student, well, in part, there are other people right now praying for healing, and you may be the answer to their prayer. God is preparing you to be a medical doctor so that you can be the person who heals their child of a debilitating illness at some later point. And there will be other people praying in the future. So, yes, we pray, but yes, we also work. We, we do uh, the work, and we do work um, something like what Jesus is actually speaking about here. So in this passage, John the Baptist it's kind of disillusioned. He's in prison, you know, awaiting his execution, likely. And John the Baptist had heard about Jesus, and he said, I wonder if Jesus is actually the Messiah. So John sent some of his disciples over to Jesus to say, are you the one who was to come? Are you the Messiah, or shall we wait for another one? Like, what's up? Is this going to happen, or is, am I going to be locked, locked in prison for good? And so so uh, Jesus said this to John, uh, to his John's disciples. He said, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. And the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now you might think, well, okay, that's great. Jesus did all these miracles. But when we think about what we can do now with modern science and medicine and technology, blind receive their sight. The lame walk. And the lepers are cleansed. This one's a bit of a stretch because I'm talking here about the development of artificial skin. Uh, and you know synthetic uh, synthetic skin for skin grafts and that sort of thing and leprosy was a skin disease. Uh, the deaf hear cochlear implants. The dead are raised up. People who have heart attacks uh, can be brought back to life again after with a, with a, a AED. Probably there's several in this building um, because if you had a heart attack you were dead, right? But now you can be brought back to life again. Um, definitions of death have had to change uh, because of this technology. And the gospel is uh, being preached to the poor. So one of the ways that we do that is by having early tsunami alert systems in vulnerable uh, coastlands. Um, so what do we do in science for redemptive work? We bring about healing and we bring about, um, hopefully, better functioning between people and the environment. Like if there's going to be a tsunami, it would be good if humans could have good relationships with that tsunami, not be swept up by it and destroyed. 
but maybe escape and run up to higher ground. And so in, in, in uh, science, we can develop methods of communication with, uh, with satellite systems and, and ocean buoys uh, to be able to communicate ahead of time that there's going to be a tsunami and these kinds of things. So these are ways that I think science can function uh, for reconciliation. And so uh, in closing, I'll just repeat the formulation by Al Walters of what is the creation, fall, redemption uh, story. And I'm adding one word. It seems to me it's missing a bit. And I'm adding it partly because Easter is coming up, but also because I think the death of Jesus was not the end of the story. So God the Father has reconciled his created but fallen world through the death and resurrection of his son and renews it into a kingdom of God uh, by his spirit. So that is the gospel, and that is how we as Christians uh, can participate in that also in our scientific work. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'll take your questions. How do you get a scholarship for the conference? Uh, are you asking me how do you get a scholarship for the yeah, conference? If you, I was a student who wanted to come yeah, to this conference yeah. and benefit in so many ways, what would I do next? I think you would submit a poster, an abstract for a poster. Okay. Uh, and then give a talk about your summer research project from last summer or from this summer uh, and connect with other scientists uh, who are Christians at this conference. Are there bonus points for asking uh, <laughs> questions that stump the speaker? I would hope. Uh, I'm looking forward to a stumping question. Yes, yes. students, okay. are here with bonus You talked about science as extending our senses and the ways of seeing things we couldn't with our natural abilities. Uh, and you talk about telescopes and stuff. Could you expand it to a couple more disciplines? So, as a bias, I'd love to hear a bit of computer science, but there's also, you mentioned psychology, some other things as well. Is there a limit to that, or does that extend to all of science? Um. I guess some sciences are more sort of directly connected to like seeing and hearing and touching. Tasting usually not so much. Uh, smelling often, I guess. So any kind of technology that extends any of those senses. In fact, I guess the, really there's also a sixth sense, like proprioception, which is like our sense of where we are in space and orientation and that sort of thing. So any kind of technology that that enhances those or maybe even replaces those for people who have lost those, right? So the cochlear implant one, um, you know, maybe people hearing degrades and then have that replaced um, with some kind of electronic uh, sensor. And, you know, now we have uh, sniffing robots, right, that can smell things, um, which and, and smell things a lot better than humans can. So like uh, in computer science and robotics, so um, my wife works in horticulture, and one of the things that is being developed in that field for large-scale horticulture is um, is through artificial intelligence and machine learning, where uh, all kinds of chemical sensors and optical sensors are being used to just look at and smell and sample like everything about all kinds of plants, and then have human observers walk by like the next day and note when they see a pest or a, a, a weed. Or, or something like that, or, or mold, or um, rot, or something like that. So they would human reporting, and then machine sensing, and then uh, through large-scale uh, machine learning, put all these things together so that the idea is that if that those sniffers are going to say, this will be where a weed will be in three days, and then do a little spot of a little drop of alcohol there, and then the weed won't come there, right? Uh, or this this part of these these tomatoes are going to be developing a bit of blight if we don't do anything. But if we do something now, we can actually intercept. And so, uh, I mean, expert human people could not even do any of that because we're not able to sniff and see at that level of accuracy. So you need like human observers frequently. Um, but so I guess that's an example where computer science can be doing um, can be part of that extension of senses. Uh, is that the kind of thing you're getting at, or? No, but I have another example. So that's okay, sure, other examples, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I was going to take yours as another example. Mm -hmm. uh, in computing science, we talk about basically the universe being more than just the things that are created that are being seen. In computing science, can be a view into the things that God's created that are unseen. And so I know physics has relationships with that, too, uh, where, like, electricity, you can't see it, but you can observe it through technology and things as well. Sure, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, right, so we're not just, like, a microscope doesn't only give you the ability to like see better, but also see more broadly, like looking at uh, different wavelengths. In fact, this uh, James Webb Space Telescope is looking at the infrared 
part of the spectrum, and we have telescopes that look in gamma the spectrum, the radio spectrum, um, the ultraviolet, uh, all of the different parts of the spectrum. Um, so we're we're, we're um, able to see things and 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 study things like like uh, most solid matter is 99.999 percent empty space, uh, and and we can learn about this through methods of like shooting particles, like so the Rutherford experiment where you where you shoot alpha particles at a gold foil and then you notice they scatter back. And then from that, you can say, well, this is like us seeing what would happen if I threw, you know, baseballs at a wire mesh or something like that. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of unseen things. And I guess uh, in, in, in the scientific disciplines, we're able to learn about and sort of we use the seeing metaphor in a sense, like I now we can we can see into the atom or see into the nucleus which is not really seeing, but it's it's becoming aware of the structure and and uh, relationships there. Yes, we got a question over here from Maddie. I know all of your names, so Maddie. <laughs> um, forgive me if you already like partly answered this, but when you talked about um, like the curse and what is what is not the curse, you talked about um, cancer being like in the dinosaur bones so that came before. But I know that it's like commonly thought that like disease and sickness is coming after the perfectness of the Garden of Eden. So I'm wondering kind of how you balance that between believing that sin is not from God and it came after his perfect garden as described or... Um, yeah, that's a, it's, a, it's a really difficult and tricky question and I can't say I'm an expert on that. I did hear a great podcast of a, a couple of days ago. It probably was on the Biologos uh, podcast. Um, uh, Bethany Solrader has a great book. Bethany Solrader is a past uh, student and early career representative for the CSEA. She now is, she's now a professor in in the UK. I think it's Exeter. Um, she's from Edmonton. And she's from Edmonton. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I think one of the things to, th to think about is you said the word perfect there in, in, the, in the garden. And, um, and sometimes I think we might confuse good with perfect. Um, I think the word perfect in the Bible speaks to completeness and uh, fullness. And I don't think that the word perfect is referred to in terms of the biblical narrative of the Garden of Eden, where the good, the word good is applied there, right? So God saw all that he had made and it was very, was, was good, was good, 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 very good. Um, um, and good, in terms of humans, may have a different meaning than good more broadly. Um, but I think it's we do have to take into account what we learn from science to make statements about um, about what the effects of the fall would have been. So could it have been that if there had been no fall into sin, that people could have still gotten cancer? And I think the answer to that is yes. And I think that the fall into sin has resulted in a bad relationship between us and cancer. Um, I guess I compare it to a bit like, like I think that without sin, you could still stub your toe, but with sin, you probably might swear and yell at your kids when you stub your toe. Um, some of this is explored in a book that uh, Dr. Harry Cook actually uh, translated uh, called um, Dawn, um, which is a sort of a narrative story retelling of the history and future of the world. Um, so the fact that cancer was around before the human fall into sins must somehow be taken into account when we think about what, uh, what we would mean by a good world and what might be a perfect world uh, there could be differences between the future perfect world and the past good world. Uh, in fact, that's one problem that people have with the book Creation Regained by Al Walters, that it sounds like some parts of uh, Christian thinking is that we're going to just get back to the garden. But in fact, the Bible talks about a progression from a garden to a city. Revelation ends with there being a, a holy city. Um, and so there will be ongoing future development but yet somehow without there being tears and sadness and so forth in the, in the, full, in the fully restored and redeemed uh, created reality. Um, so there's just a few 
thoughts? I probably haven't answered your question. Arnold, you have a question here. A question over here. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned in the creation segment that uh, in science we have to trust our senses are that they're giving us real information about the world around us. Um, but typically, like faith is like believing in something unseen. So, like a lot of people would take that to understand that they're like sort of contradictory. So, how would you like navigate that apparent contradiction? So, you're saying that uh, I think I might have missed what you said. Like believing. Is different than seeing, is what you're... Yeah, it's, it's sort of like, I sort of think of Thomas about it when I think about that uh, comparison. Mm -hmm. It's like, he doesn't believe until he sees, yeah. but we're called to believe without seeing. Yeah, so that, like, in fact, uh, didn't Jesus tell Thomas, like, uh, something like that, where he said, you know, you, uh, you, you saw and believed. Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe, right? Um, I mean, I think in, in the sciences... We don't just go around believing things without having any evidence for them, right? Now, there's a difference, I think, between between like beliefs in God than um, you know beliefs that you know atoms exist, for example. In some sense, we can't see atoms, but in some other senses, we can see atoms. Um, and the way that we see atoms is through atomic force microscopes um, and through gold foil alpha particle experiments, um, and so. The word see could be thought of in terms of in science we need evidence. So in I think in, in even in believing in God, we still need evidence, but it's a different kind of evidence. Uh, scientific evidence has to be empirical evidence that should be accessible to all people uh, in principle, right? Um, so that anyone who looks through the microscope would see the same thing when they're properly prepared for what they're seeing. I think it's possible even for like a student and an expert to see different things through the same microscope view, right? Like, um, in fact, I'm talking to people who don't know necessarily all the different kinds of coniferous trees. You walk in a forest and you see coniferous trees, whereas someone else will see pine, hemlock, um, you know, spruce, fir, um, all these different things, and they see things differently because of their different positioning. Um, so... But that being said, uh, once everyone has the same level of background and training, they should be able to see the same thing. That is, to be able to acknowledge the evidence for the same things that are being put forward as evidences for the scientific theories. So, but our belief in God and our belief in Jesus is not based in the same way on seeing. Not all of us can be Thomas, who actually get to put our finger in Jesus' side and in his hands to see the, feel those wounds. Uh, but yet we can take it on their testimony. So there's the, the rationality for Christian faith is 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 not without evidence, but it's a different kind of evidence. And there's also a more of a personal and subjective aspect to it than there is for the scientific kind of knowledge. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, back to uh, the topic on the cancer or the fall of sin. Um, would that cancer not have led to death or whatnot? Uh, the result of sin, death, and like how does that work? Um, okay, so the I'm I'm pretty sure that that dinosaur died probably of that cancer. Um, now, when the Bible speaks about sin leading to death, um, uh, it's often sometimes understood by people as being any kind of death that occurred anywhere in the world is a result of human sin. Whereas I think what the scripture is teaching us there is that human sin led to human death. And so humans died because of human sin. You know, even the nature of that death is, is, is not totally obvious because even that day, the humans did not biologically die but yet something about their close relationship with God died. Um, so um, so I would just uh, suggest that when the scripture speaks about death, leading, death being caused by sin, it's speaking about human death and human sin, not death of other creatures, because we have really good scientific evidence for there being uh, millions of years of living beings who came and went long before humans were on the scene. 
Arnold. Yes, John. Uh, this might be a good place to put a plug in for the CSCA uh, pamphlets. And I don't know if uh, we can bring that up on the screen or not. There was a, on the CSCA website, there are a number of uh, pamphlets available. So if you go to CSEA.ca slash pamphlets, and they were on the screen at one point earlier as well. Um, and one of them speaks about this, these topics. Yeah, one that happens to speak, I happen to know about it because I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to speak right to this very question about death and the, the whole Genesis 3 account and our misunderstanding and how we use language. Um, it's a bit of the Princess Bride effect. Um, I don't think that word means what you think it means. When you say see, I see something. And I see, well, sometimes I'm saying, oh, I'm aware of it. Oh, I understand it now. I see it. Mm -hmm. And that's very different than I see Arnold right now. Mm -hmm. So some of it's language, some of it's, there's a number of other features. But those pamphlets cover a whole entire series of questions that show up. I remember the one by John. CSCA, <laughs> but you can see the topics that show up. There we go. Ecology and the necessity of death. So John Wood, he's a, the best person to ask this question of in this audience, I would say. I did refer to Bethany Solerator, but I should have mentioned John as well. But there's a number of these kinds of pamphlets that are available. The nice thing about CSCA and AS and these organizations is that you get the thinking of Christian men and women who are in the professional fields in philosophy, theology, in the natural and social sciences. That thinking all comes together. It gives you an opportunity to be able to hear from lots of different voices because these are challenging and contested ideas and have been historically. Well, I think we've been treated this afternoon, thank you so much, Arnold, to an invitation into more dialogue, into more thinking, into challenging us uh, on many levels. Here's some great resources. Uh, on our CSCA page. I encourage you all, and I'd like to say, I hope this is all right, Arnold, that Arnold's going to be on campus for the next couple of hours and would be open to speaking with any of you who would like to talk to him a little more. Thanks again to all of you for coming, and we look forward to interacting in the future.